Hello, Internet. Welcome to the stream. So the first thing um, I want to show you, so I want to really give you a very basic introduction into how the PDF file format works, because maybe that could be interesting to people. And what I show on the, on the screen currently is a um, almost minimal PDF file that um, is very small, so it has 72 lines. So maybe the first surprise to some is that uh, you can actually open this file in a text editor because PDF is a text-based based format, uh, crazily enough, with some qualifications as, as we will see later. And it's quite small and it contains everything uh, that is required by the PDF standard in order to display a page with some text if you open it. So let's just bring this file up in a PDF viewer. So you see it's really just a, a square of white electronic paper uh, with this hello world string. And let's uh, quickly go through the, the contents of the PDF that make this uh, appear in the PDF view. So for sure you could uh, forge a smaller PDF file that also displays some, something um, by uh, leaving out a lot of stuff that PDF readers do not strictly require or so they, the, the standard requires it. I just, here I, I did not want to go with it down to, to as few characters as possible. What I wanted to do is to make a nicely readable file that um, serves as a good example what makes up a PDF file. So uh, PDF is an object-oriented format. It's a kind of container format that contains objects. Qu um, quite similar in, in some respects to an object-oriented format like JSON, so a textual notation for um, data objects. And just uh, like in, in JSON, you have some primitive types like integers that we see here. For example, here we have the integer one. You have um, aggregate types like arrays. Here we see an array with one element. Here we see an array with uh, four elements. For example, this is an array that uh, contains four integers. Hi, Shiloh May, or however that is pronounced. Welcome to the channel. Um, so for example, here we have an array of uh, four integers. Um, the most common data type, actually the com most common aggregate data type is dictionaries. So associative, uh, an associative data type that associates to, um, uh, associates values to keys. Um, again, very similar, like you have it in, in JSON. For example, here we have a dictionary that starts with the double um, angle. It has a key type and the associated value is catalog. And it has a key pages and the associated value is this thing, um, which is actually a one data item containing of these uh, three tokens. And that is called an indirect object reference. And that's where all the magic in this format starts. So the objects that you have in the, in the file that are contained by the file can refer to each other quite, free, quite freely. And um, it works in this way that uh, you identify an object by its identifier number and the generation number. And then you have the special keyword character R that turns this into a reference. So this is a reference to object two, generation number zero. And we actually find this object below here with identifier two, generation number zero. An object is the keyword that starts a so-called indirect object. And indirect objects are exactly those to which you can refer in this matter. 
in, in this manner. And this object continues until the end object keyword. And in this case, uh, you see it's just a dictionary. And um, yeah, so how does a PDF reader read this file? Uh, one thing is it might recognize at the beginning of the file, you have these, uh, this magic comment that uh, specifies that this is a PDF file and it gives the version number of the PDF standard that is applied here. But actually the, uh, the PDF reader must start at the end of the file for, for reasons that we will soon understand. So at the end of the file, there's another magic comment marker, this end of file marker. And the PDF reader will look for that somewhere near the end of the file. It does not need to be at, at very strictly at the end. And just and from this point, it will work backwards. Um, at least that's, that's what it does when it gets a, a very well-formed PDF. Uh, PDF readers typically have all kinds of less strict reading modes when they get a damaged or incomplete PDF, then they can reconstruct missing parts of, of those files. But in, in this case, we have a complete file that has everything that the standard requires. So the next thing the reader looks at is this start xref, uh, start xref keyword and uh, this integer here. And this integer gives the absolute file offset of the cross-reference table of this PDF file. Um, and now you might already start to see why I, I said, yeah, it's, it's basically a textual format, but with some qualifications, because it is kind of a hybrid format of a textual format that also uses uh, byte offsets for random access. So this is really a byte offset into this file. And in this case, it points to the, the beginning of the XREF keyword here that marks the beginning of the cross-reference tape. And these kinds or these kind of um, absolute byte offsets make it quite hard to write a PDF file by hand, because if you type it as a text file, it's quite hard to keep all these byte offsets, and there, there will be many more, as you will see later, to keep all these byte offsets consistent. And um, so the the format being textual is not really that useful as you might think in the beginning. It's, it might make it a bit more readable, but that's also, as we will see, um, that's also uh, an advantage that will be diminished by other features. But it's definitely hard to, to write it like, like a text file because you have these mixed in uh, direct access um, features like they're typical for binary formats. And so <clears throat> for generating test files like this, I created myself a little tool. Um, I call it a, a PDF assembler because it basically does what, what any other assembler does. It, takes a format that looks very similar to the final file, but you can specify symbolic uh, references for offsets, for example. So I say here that after the start XREF, I want the offset of the XREF table. And this is defined by this, by this label here that comes directly before the XREF keyword. So this, we will later use this tool to, to create some other uh, interesting PDF files or some more interesting ones. Okay, so the next thing is the reader goes to this cross-reference table and this just contains a funny, um, in a funny uh, fixed, fixed uh, width uh, SC format, contains a database of the objects in the file. Uh, it starts with object identifier zero and goes on for six objects. And here you see the table. Uh, there are two kinds of entries, the free entries with the F here and the used entries with the N. 
And there are lots of de details about this that I won't go into, but for the used entries, it's quite simple. The first column is the byte offset in decimal. The second column is the generation number. And the last column marks it as a used uh, entry. And so by reading this cross reference table, the PDF reader can uh, know exactly where in the file all the indirect objects are. So it does not have to uh, parse the whole file when it wants a specific object. And you can imagine that in, in very large PDFs, so for example, I have a PDF on my hard disk that has over 200,000, I think over 280,000, or yeah, definitely over 200,000 objects. And so uh, the random access can become quite important then. Although PDF readers do, do fall back to, to reading uh, the objects one after the other if this cross-reference table is damaged or missing, for example. Okay, and this, yeah, th these, these offsets simply point uh, to the beginnings of these indirect objects. So, for example, the first one would point here. And then you, um, you have this, the syntax that we already discussed. Now, um, so much for the lexical structure and the file format. So how does the, the logical structure look like? Well, um, now we must discuss this element that comes be after the cross-reference table, but before the start xref keyword, the trailer, it's uh, the keyword trailer and then a dictionary. And this dictionary contains some important pointers uh, for the consumer of the file to find the most important information. Most importantly, the root key that uh, points to the catalog object of this document. And so here we see that the root object is indirect object one zero. So let's go there. Let's go to one zero. Um, and this is again a dictionary and it has a type catalog. So associated to the name type. So by the way, these strings that start with, uh, with uh, slashes are called name objects. They are basically uh, like, like strings with a, um, a simplified syntax. So you can understand them just as strings or as, as uh, symbols. They are typically short, and there are many no, many many um, names that have uh, well-defined meanings that are defined by the PDF standard. And so, for example, this is marked as type catalog. It's the main document catalog, and it has an associated pages object. The pages object is the start of the so-called page tree. So the, the individual pages in a PDF are not organized in a flat list. They are organized in a tree structure, which I think has uh, two reasons. The first one is that um, a PDF can have a very large number of pages. And then, uh, especially in the older days when, when computers didn't have so much memory, you might not want to, to read a, a very, very large list of uh, page references at once into memory. And so you want to uh, split this page list up into individual chunks. That's one thing you can do with the page tree. Another thing that you can do is you can build up a kind of inheritance structure where, you, where pages inherit certain properties from uh, nodes higher up in this page tree. So um, you, for example, you can define some commonly used resources that let's say you have the same 
image like an icon on every page then you could uh, reference this image in a resource directory that is um, referenced by uh, for example by the top pages node and this will be automatically will, will automatically be available to all the objects that are beneath that in the page tree so i think those are the two reasons to have this kind of structure in in our case the page tree is extre extremely simple it's one dictionary of type pages that has this array kids it actually has only a single child node that is object three and the count tells you how many pages are actually represented by this intermediate node in the page tree and it's only one in this case and if we go down to 30 to object 30 uh, that is the actual page objects and these page objects they are of course very central in pdf because they represent really a page that you can um, look at in in the pdf reader and it has a parent pointer that goes back up the page tree to the pages object it has most importantly a uh, reference to the contents object that we will soon look at that contains actually what is on the page and it has the also very important resources key and this resources key is associated again with the dictionary and this dictionary can specify a lot of stuff uh, it specifies all the additional objects that can be referenced by the contents of the page so for example if you use a specific font on the page this is referenced by the resources dictionary if you uh, put an image on the page this image is not directly stored in the contents this image is a separate object that is referenced by the resources dictionary and is then instantiated by a operator in the in the contents um, yeah and then finally what the last required item or, or key is the media box that specifies the the size of the page in in units that are by default a one over one over 72 of an inch so if you would so 100 units is um, somewhat larger than an inch so my page is specified to be um, somewhat like an inch by an inch a bit more right? so here it's actually already zoomed in uh, four times okay so now to the most interesting thing probably is the actual page contents this is again a separate object and this is a very interesting type of object that we have not discussed yet because this is a stream object and streams are really um, very important are, are very important object type in, in pdf files because streams are where the large binary data is put and also where large text objects are put and these uh, streams have quite a few features for example they allow data compression which i do not use in this file here but typically uh, such a content stream in a pdf will not be plain text like it is here but it will be uh, compressed typically with the deflate algorithm of uh, setlib and this uh, deflate algorithm will be specified in this dictionary that precedes the stream this is called the stream dictionary and this gives some attributes for decoding the stream in, in our case it's the most simple stream dictionary that you can have it just specifies the length of the encoded stream data which in our case is actually uh, the plain text length typically this would be the length of the setlib compressed data for example 
Okay, and um, if you look at this stream, uh, it's basically a sequence of ASCII characters, like a long string. In our case, it's not very long, but it can be. So for streams, there's no implementation defined uh, limit on their length, as opposed to strings that you can also have in, in normal um, non-stream objects. You can have strings, but they might have some implementation limit on their length. Uh, these uh, streams, on the other hand, they, they can basically have arbitrary length up to what your file system can support, theoretically. And as I said, they can be compressed, which is very useful for either large text data or for image data, for example. So if you, if you would have a, a JPEG image in your PDF, that would also be represented by a stream. And the stream dictionary would, uh, would then uh, specify the JPEG decompression filter as the, for decompression. So that actually would say DCT filter for discrete cosine transform. Um, decode. In our case we don't have filters because our stream is in plain text and it just contains a few so-called operators and here we really see the uh, postscript heritage of PDF. So PDF was as far as I know was done by the people who had done postscript before um, or at least it was heavily influenced by, by postscript. It's not not actually like PostScript because PostScript is a real programming language and <clears throat> this was not taken over by a PDF but a lot of the syntax and the kind of postfix notation and so that they have in, in PostScript and the graphical model for describing graphics to be put on the page is, is very heavily uh, borrowed from PostScript. The the graphics operators that we have here is a begin text operator. Uh, this starts a text object that goes until end text here. And it contains the following. So it contains a reference to a font. This font, so the, the F01 was a name that I chose that is defined in the font dictionary of the page to, be, to refer to indirect object 4. So um, we have a certain font that we can quickly look at later. It is a 10 point large and the TF is then the operator that actually sets the font. So we have this funny postscript notation uh, or postfix notation similar to uh, reverse uh, Polish notation like you have it on some um, HP calculators for example. So first you have the, oper the operands and then you have the operator that sets actually the, the font. Then we have a placement operator that puts the text at coordinates 2020. And then we have actually a string. So uh, parentheses are the quoting characters in PDF for literal strings. And a string is just hello word. And then we have TJ, which actually tells uh, the uh, PDF processor to, um, to render the preceding string as text. And that's exactly what we, what we see here. Uh, the, the font is also specified, as I mentioned, in one of these indirect objects. And in this case, we are using one of the base fonts, so there are 12 base fonts that are predefined in PDF. And I think it's actually not, not a nice thing that we are, what we are doing here because we are using this base font without defining it in the file itself. So actually uh, this PDF will not look exactly the same on every viewer and we can directly verify that by opening this in a, a different PDF viewer, Sumatra PDF. So let's, let's bring this PDF file up. And if I manage to, to put them side by side here, 
and we zoom in, you will notice that, oh, it's actually a bad example because they look very, very similar. They might even be the same. So let's, let's go back to a different font. Um, let's go to my input file and let's change this to Helvetica. And let's regenerate those files, which I think currently could fail because I have this file open. So let's try this again. Yeah, now we have it in, in Helvetica typeface and I think now we will see a different in the fonts here so you will see if you for example if you look at the R you will notice that those R's are quite different so uh, that's the problem because we have not actually embedded the font that we used which for example, in, in PDF slash A, the, the archive, the, the subset of PDF intended for archival storage, you would be required to actually embed the font description, which we did not do. And so we have this, um, these different renderings because these PDF viewers use different uh, fonts for the, the typeface called Helvetica. Okay, so much to a basic uh, PDF file. Are there any questions in chat? Do you have any questions that you want to ask before we go to more interesting PDF files? Because I want to try a few things now that I have this PDF assembler. Because, I mean, um, the first thing that I think about when I, as a programmer, I read about such a data format like PDF, and it's this kind of textual data format with the, all these objects referring to each other, I think of all the ways that this co could go wrong. And in PDF, there are thousands of ways that uh, that things can go wrong and that you cannot have invalid or ambiguous data. It's, a, in my opinion, a very, very poorly designed uh, data format. <clears throat> it, the, the way I pre presented it now might make it appear a little cleaner than it actually is because the devil is as often is in the details and there are lots of details um, in PDF. Oh, actually, I should not. I should not change this here because in this file I will actually ru ru um, ruin the file because the, if I delete something by hand, the offsets will not not match anymore. So I should actually regenerate this. I should close it here and regenerate it. Okay. So as we have no um, questions, let's just um, check if this still works. Yeah. And let's try some more interesting stuff. And let's see how PDF readers react to this interesting stuff. So um, reading PDF files can actually be quite tricky for many, many reasons. One of the reasons is that is the length of, of data objects. <clears throat> in, in many cases, you do, not, you do not know the length of objects in the PDF file beforehand. So as you might know, if you're a programmer yourself, if you read something from a file, it's very, very handy if you, if you know the, the size of the data you're going to read. Um, it helps you with memory management and, and lots of things. 
And for PDF, this is typically not the case. So uh, typically it's quite hard to find out how large data objects are. One example are these stream objects. So we have here the simplest case uh, where it's actually not that bad because we don't know how large the, the stream dictionary is, but once we have parsed the stream dictionary, we have here the length of the, at least of the encoded stream data. We don't know the length of the decoded stream data, which is also a problem because we don't know, uh, when we read it, we don't know how much memory to reserve for uh, decompressing and so on. So that's another topic, but at least we know the length of the decompressed data. And the reason we, <coughs> sorry, the reason we need to know is that we cannot re rely on the end stream keyword because the end stream keyword can also appear in the middle of the stream just as a piece of text. So the, the PDF standard says that you should not do that, but it does not really strictly ban it. So uh, a reader must really be able to deal with that. I have made an example file where you can, when, where you can see that. So this is a kind of evil example file where you have this uh, PDF stream here. And inside the stream, but still in the middle of the stream actually, as just as text, uh, you have these stream and end stream keywords appearing again at the beginning of the line. And the stream continues and ends actually here, which the syntax highlighting gets wrong in this case. Um, and the way that the reader knows this is because the, the decoded length is specified here and this 80 byte offset starting from the first byte of the stream actually points to after the ET, exactly at the new line that comes after the ET. So uh, the, re the reader in this case can find out how long the string is and this actually works in all the, the PDF readers I tested. Uh, so if you if you open this file, so PDF Exchange Viewer, for example, has no problem with this. Uh, I think some Sumatra handles it also, but it has this. I think it has a small bug here. I, I still need to research if this is a bug or not, because it does not. You see that it does not have these these spaces here. Um, it's missing the spaces between object and stream, for example. These are actually new lines and I, I need still need to research for my own software what would be the right thing to do. I guess the PDF exchange viewer is right that it renders the new lines as spaces in a, in a stream. Um, we can also check some other, so Foxit. Let's check Foxit viewer. makes it quite, yeah, renders it also in the same way with the spaces. So this works in, in all the views I checked. So no problem here, but uh, what is <clears throat> very nasty for readers is that uh, you do not always have this simple case where you have a, an integer here because the length can also be an indirect object. So you can have a reference here to a, another object that tells you the length of the that tells you the length of the string, and this is actually used a lot in PDF files because it's more convenient for the program writing the PDF to first write down the whole stream data and afterwards write down the length. And so often you have here a reference that goes to an object that actually comes later in the PDF file and tells you the length. So let's look at an example like that. Um, we have that here. So it's very similar to the previous file, but in this case, uh, you see that the length is specified as an indirect object and almost every object that you can specify directly, like here in the dictionary as the value, almost every object is also allowed to be an indirect object. So in, it's not allowed for quite everything. So there are a few exceptions where it's not allowed but uh, for most um, 
so in general it's allowed and especially for the length it is allowed and if you go to object 6 you see that actually the 80 is here so only by going here uh, the reader knows that it must read 80 bytes here even though the end stream keyword is already uh, here you can imagine now that Reading this gets quite tricky, especially if the cross-reference table would be absent or damaged because it's hard to parse this file from the beginning because you come here to object 5 and you don't know the length of the following data and when you run through the data you see strange things like a fake object starting here and stream and end stream, you don't really know. Uh, is this part of the text of the stream or is it really the end stream keyword? In this file, because this is a valid file, actually you don't have the problem because you can go to the end of the file, you can read the cross-reference table and this tells you where object 6 is even before you have passed object 5. And so you can use the value from object uh, 6 to, to tell you the uh, the length of the of the stream so that that is still that is a bit of a nasty file but it's still valid um, we could now think about trying a few things so one thing we could do for example I have not tried this so I could try this right now live to actually omit the cross-reference table and see what the readers will do um, so let's make a new, let's first open the input file. Um, and let's save this as So, and let's simply remove the, the cross-reference data. Um, we could put an empty, let's just, first let's try just to remove it. Uh, we need to add a command to generate this file actually. using my using my PDF assembler so let me set a bit smaller font size so I can see something okay I can still not see anything because the chat is here um, no xref okay Hi feet, how are you doing? What's up? So let's let's generate this stuff. Okay, we should now have this. Let's check in a hex editor if our file has been generated and if it looks okay. So should should be called no should be in test. No xref. Yeah. And it just has xref new line and then trailer. So let's see what PDF Exchange reader says to this file. Okay. And here we see it's not able to display the text. It does not crash at least but it's not able to display the text so it has some problem with this file which is fair enough it's it's no longer a valid file actually I should have put it in the in the invalid folder I will later move it there so this would be yeah also also Sumatra cannot open this file 
because, because this file can no longer be parsed reliably from, from beginning to end, um, we could try to make it, let's just for trying things, let's just remove the end string keyword or let's just shift the end string keyword a bit so it is not at the beginning of the line. And let's try again. Let's just, I need to close this because otherwise I cannot write the file. So now it could actually, could actually work. Yeah, still doesn't work. So the completely missing cross reference seems to be a problem here for this reader. Also for this one. Okay, so no big surprises here. Let's restore this and I will later move this to the invalid folder. But now let's, let's be more evil. Let's be more evil. Actually, something that still works is a double reference that is already quite annoying. So we can um, reference object six as the length and object six is a reference to object seven and seven actually contains the length. So if we look at the final PDF file, so we have six, it's a reference to seven and seven actually contains the length 80. And that should just work fine. That is legal as far as I know, even though it's crazy, but yeah, this, this is working. Um, so now for the evil, evil invalid stuff. <clears throat> you might get ideas because we have two objects and objects can reference to each other. So as an evil programmer or rather as a, not an evil programmer, but as a programmer who has been burned many times by evil data structures, you of course say to yourself, what if the objects refer to each other? And this is what we built here. So we have um, length is in object six, six is a reference to seven and seven is a reference to six. That's quite mean. So that's definitely an invalid PDF file. I mean, it's strict, it's, it's even well formed at least. So the syntax is, is right and everything. The, all the byte offsets are correct, but it is not um, semantically correct, so not, not valid. Actually, I tried a validation tool uh, called Jove and that actually, I think it says this file is valid, but you will see what happens when we open this in a PDF reader. Depends on the reader, but so let's try PDF Exchange Viewer, which is actually my favorite uh, PDF viewer for everyday use. And let's see, mutual reference. Works fine, quite surprising. Uh, let's try another Sumatra. Mutual reference, okay, it doesn't work. So we see different behavior. Uh, let's try yet another. Let's try the slim PDF reader that we have not tried so far. Now I immediately dislike this program because of this ugly dull gray interface. But what's even worse is if you open the about box, this is really amazing in this viewer. If you open the about box, you get this very nice warning blah, 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 this computer program is protected and they, you get all kinds of threats like result in severe civil and criminal penalties and will be prosecuted to the maximum extent possible under the law if you do something that they do not like. So that's their way of introducing their company. Don't mess with us or we will 
um, will kill you in court. Very nice, very nice company. And let's see how they handle this file. Okay, error. Still not too bad. But we have more evil stuff later coming. Um, let's see what I, what did I try? Yeah, that's the next thing. So this, this mutual reference was not too bad. So we got some different behavior from the viewers, but at least none of the viewers crashed. So let's try something even more insane. We have again the, the stream here, um, but now it says for length, look at object four, but object four is the stream itself. So it, it gives a, a reference to itself. So that's the final PDF file length is object for reference and that's the stream itself so well formed but certainly invalid let's see what the viewers say to this file pdf exchange viewer interesting it is displays something just fine seems to ignore this, this self-reference. So what does Sumatra view say, Sumatra PDF? Does not render the page, so, but also no error message. So let's try slim PDF viewer. Oh, oh. That was too, too invalid for slim PDF viewers. So we have crashed our first PDF reader. Let me take a sip to celebrate that. So all the legal threats have not helped this viewer to survive this blatantly invalid file. And now the reason why I'm doing this is not because I want to bitch about PDF viewers, but because I'm actually writing my own different PDF software and I'm thinking about all these cases. What, what do I need to check against in my code? I need to detect these cycles. So if, um, if, the, if I get a file and I get these cyclical references, I need to detect them in time not to crash because <clears throat> it's very easy when you, when you get these cycles that you can, for example, completely burn your stack through by, by doing infinite uh, recursion in your code and, and just using up all the stack and then you, that's probably what happened here that makes this program crash. So, but now what I'm really looking forward to is I want to check this with Acrobat Reader, what, what Acrobat Reader says about these invalid files. We have not checked that so far. And actually I still need to download Acrobat and I didn't, do it before the stream because I wanted to show you something that is hilarious. So the first thing is that Acrobat first tells you that Adobe Reader is the free global standard. So that's already interesting. They call the program a standard, not, not the ISO standard that they push through, but they, they call the program a standard. The program is the free global standard for reliably viewing and so on PDF documents, okay? Um, it's of course connected to the cloud like every crap is today. And then <laughs> um, is they say it's the only PDF viewer that can open an index with all types of PDF content. And that's really an interesting situation if you think about it because PDF is an ISO standard, right? And it's meant to be the standard for the whole world to, to store all our documents also for long-term use and so on. And here they very openly say that their program is the only one that can handle everything. And I believe them because it, PDF is so complicated. So the, the simple intro that I did does, does not do it any justice at all because just the, the, 
the PDF standard 1.7 is about, I think, 900 pages. I have it somewhere here in my recent files. It is, yeah, 750 pages without the normative references. And the normative references uh, probably comprise thousands of pages if you take them all together. So, and, and um, yeah, it's getting bigger, bigger and, and all the time. And it's extremely complicated. And so it's probably true that, that AcroWebG is the only PDF view that actually supports everything. But now that comes the most hilarious part. You have the Adobe Software Licensing Agreement for Reader that of course you must read before downloading the reader. And now guess what format this, this license agreement is in. It's of course a PDF file. <laughs> That's so funny. It's um, so, um, thank God I have a, I have a different PDF viewer because um, otherwise you will have a problem, right? That's just, that's just so funny that they, just after telling you that their program is the only one that can really do PDF right, they give it a license agreement as a PDF file. That's so nice. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how the self-reference will be handled by Adobe Reader. And then I actually have a, another file that we can look at in the meantime. So PDF supports a lot of image formats for compression of images. And one of these formats is the very complicated JBIG2 JBIG format. Um, used for compressing black and white images is a very complicated image format uh, that I actually have done a lot of streaming about already because I implemented a JPEG2 decoder or I'm still in, in the process of implementing one. I have one that, that works, works for the basic cases. And so JPEG2 is a very compli complicated image format and also its embedding into PDF is non-trivial uh, because uh, the special th one special thing about JBIG2 is that JBIG2 is a multi-page image format. So you can have a JBIG2 stream that actually describes multiple images and that can be useful because uh, data can be reused from one page to the next for getting better compression and um, for example, JBIG2 uh, can store the text symbols um, used on a page in, in a reused symbol dictionary that you can use for, for multiple pages. If you embed a JBIG2 file in a PDF, it, it works in the following way that it is a stream like every other image but it can refer to a different object that has these reusable global sections. And there you have this uh, reference uh, associated with the key JBIG2 globals. That is exactly for this use case that you can have some data that is used by multiple uh, JBIG2 pages. And of course, Again, we have the, the problem that this stream now can only be decoded, decoded if you resolve this reference because you need this data to decode the data in this, in this stream. So what if this reference is invalid and goes either to the stream itself or there are two streams mutually uh, referencing each other? And that's, that's something I tried. So I set up a file here where I have actually valid JBIG2 data. So the data itself is fine. It's actually self-contained. It wouldn't even need the global data. But it says here in object four, my global data is in object six. Okay, I have the same problem here. I think 
I think the website gave me the wrong version because it's again the reader DC. Yeah. Um, so it specifies object six as the globus object. And if you go to object six, it has actually the same data. So also valid JB2 data, but it references back to as, as, as its global object to stream four. So again, you have this cyclical dependency that cannot be resolved. Um, final file is here. Yeah, here you actually see now the, you see the binary data here messing up the editor screen. And this is actually the reason that I said before that the textual nature of PDF is not that useful as it might look at in the beginning because most uh, most PDFs if you open them in the editor actually look something like that because they have a lot of compressed binary data inside and actually only a few textual sections that you can actually read in between. So let's see what our PDF viewers say to this cyclical JB2 reference. Hmm, sorry. I don't know what I did now. Oh, I think it crashes when it tries to create a preview of the page or something. Does it preview? I think it has a preview here, maybe. Let, let's look at something valid. Yeah, it brings up the preview here, okay. And it immediately crashes when I, when I go to the inverted file. Yeah, the program immediately crashes due to the preview. So let's try to disable the preview. Interestingly, there's no crash report. I don't know why that is. Oh, yeah, now the preview is closed, so we should be able to open the file and, yeah, crashes on opening. So preview off, yeah, crash. So I was, I was quite disappointed when I tried this the first time that my favorite PDF reader, which I'm very happy with otherwise this PDF exchange viewer is just a joy to use I find and it's very with valid PDF files it's very smooth and very stable very nice program but it yeah does not like this file crashes so these things do not seem to be checked by by, by the software so Sumatra PDF is actually more stable it just says can render so let's try slim PDF, the litigious PDF viewer with the ugly gray interface. Crashes. I would so have liked to, to test Acrobat Reader with this. Let's see what Foxy Reader does. Mm, just displays an empty page, so no notice. And that's actually a big problem with PDFs that the readers are so um, laissez-faire about uh, these things that um, they actually, I mean, most of the errors that you can have, they actually survive and they either display almost everything or um, they even manage to display the page somehow they do not notify you about errors and that's quite a problem for preservation of pdf files because people do not notice that their pdf files have invalid data in them and they might get archived including the invalid data and some le some years later on you might try to open these files and they maybe get problems because the new versions of the PDF readers maybe behave differently 
given these in invalid data or, or maybe they even crash and so on. So that's that's not not nice software engineering that the whole world has done here because I think what all these programs should do is they should notify you even if they try to repair the problem they should notify you that there is something wrong with your your PDF file. I don't know if I, I think those were the, yeah, those were the nasty things I tried that uh, this mutual self-reference. So the self-reference of the stream and, and the mutual reference of the JD2 streams, those were the, things I tried. Um, yeah, that's actually what I wanted to show today, just to um, give this basic introduction, how the file format works and give a bit of a glimpse into the many, many problems that come up if you have this kind of um, object-oriented file format that um, opens so many so many ways for the data to be inconsistent or self-referential, recursive, whatever. Um, it's just a, a scratch of the, just, just scratching the surface really because there are so many problems that you can have in PDF files. Hey guys, a short announcement from the future. I have finally managed to actually find an old version of Adobe Reader that I had already installed on my computer, stupid me. And so now we can uh, try out how Adobe Reader handles our evilly crafted invalid PDF files. I have here Adobe Reader 11, so that is version 11.0.19 what we have here. So um, let's first try the invalid file that had the mutual reference of the object specifying length. And as we already saw in the preview now, it is rendered as a blank page. So it cannot read this file, which is fine, but we do not get any error message, which is really terrible software engineering. Uh, and that's just as, as with almost all of the PDF readers, they just swallow everything and do not tell you um, even the most um, egregious things that are wrong with your files. So let's test the more evil version that has the self-reference where the stream um, actually um, reference to itself for the length field. So again, the file is not rendered, but also we don't get any error message, but at least we, we do not get a crash. And finally, the most evil version that we have is the one with the JPEG2 mutual stream reference. So let's open this one. And yeah, we get a crash. So quite amazingly, I think this was the, this, this JPEG2 reference cycle was the, probably the, the second case of invalid uh, data that I could think of while working on my own PDF code. And already we found something that crashes these quite mature uh, PDF reading application. So that's not, not very encouraging, but now we know uh, so that was that was this file that had the two JBIG2 streams uh, referring to each other as the globals string. Okay, so we have filled in this hole for YouTube exclusively. And so let's get back to the stream recording. See you.
Okay, that was what I wanted to show today, a short introduction to PDF and some crazy things that you can do. I hope there was something interesting in it for you and um, hope to see you again. Have a nice day. Bye.